So good evening, everyone. And welcome to the Manitoba Parks uh, Winter Dog Sports webinar. My name is Lindsay, and I'm a park interpreter here in Birds Hill Provincial Park, located on Treaty 1 territory, homeland of the Anishinaabe and the Métis Nation, whose peoples are deeply connected with the plants and the animals of this land. Uh, some quick housekeeping to go over very quickly. Uh, this presentation is being recorded and will be available on the Conservation and Climate YouTube channel uh, about 24 hours after the presentation airs tonight. Uh, all participants are in listen only mode, muted and cameras are disabled. Over the course of the webinar, please use the chat box for comments or if you have any questions, please put them into the Q&A box and we will strive to answer as many questions as possible towards the end of the presentation. As of tonight, I'm very happy to be partnering with our special guests, Susie and Lauren from Snow Motion Winter Dog Sports Club. Uh, they are experts in ski juring and kick sledding and they're going to share with us uh, some of their knowledge on the sports. Uh, and tell us a little bit more about them, the type of dogs that are used, uh, the equipment, and how you can get involved in ski juring and kick sledding as a way of exploring Manitoba parks and natural spaces with your four-legged friends. Uh, so because our video equipment doesn't work very well outside in the winter, we have pre-recorded uh, some footage of Susie and Lauren showing us these two awesome winter dog sports. Uh, so we're going to share our screen with you so that you can watch this footage uh, at any time while you're watching. If you have any questions uh, about the equipment or what you're seeing in the film, uh, you can pop those into the Q&A box and Susie and Lauren will be happy to answer those questions for you towards the end. Um, so I'm just going to stop my video and mute myself so that the video comes through nice and clear for you. Uh, and we'll get that started right away. So I'm here at the Group Use One Road in Birds Hill Provincial Park, which is designated for ski juring and kick sledding in the winter time. And I'm here with Susie and Lauren from Snow Motion Winter Dog Sports Club. And they're gonna tell us a little bit about uh, their club and what they do in the winter time. Okay, so Snow Motion was formed in 1997. So this is our 24th year. Uh, it's about our 14th year using the trails at Birds Hill Park. We do two sports. Uh, skijoring, which is when the dog pulls you on skis, and the second sport is kick sledding, where they pull you on a, a finish made sled. This is a great sport to be out in the winter. Uh, we really need to reclaim our winters here in Canada, and it's nice because you and your dog, uh, we often have people join the club who start out by saying they hated winter but actually tear up at the end of the season when the snow melts because they don't want to stop. So it's a lot of fun and it's a good exercise. Contrary to popular belief, our dogs do not pull us around the trail. You will ski as hard as you normally would because you got a partner and your partner doesn't like it if you don't pull your weight. And your weight's a lot heavier than hers, so you got to pull more than your fair share. So Susie and Lauren, can you tell us a bit about the dogs and the equipment used for ski shoring and kick sledding? Well, uh, contrary to popular belief, you don't have to have a husky. Uh, international dog sledding rules say a dog has to be over 26 pounds, though we've had lighter. Uh, Sansi here is sort of a normal Skijor dog. She's German Shepherd with a little bit of husky, uh, but we have Australian Shepherds, we have Border Collies, we have Huskies, we have Golden Retrievers in the club, we've even had a Jack Russell who thought he was a tough Skajor dog, <laughs> and but maybe didn't pull as much as he could have. So basically if your dog's over 26 pounds and over a year ready to go. Now it's very important that year bit because like all animals, dog skeletons are highly cartilage when they're younger. And if you have a dog pulling in harness when they're too young, you could actually damage and modify their skeletons. <clears throat> so our rule of thumb is that no dog should be pulling hard until they're a year old. And if they're a purebred in a Mastiff line, like German Shepherds or Labs, where they might have hip dysplasia, we like 14 months. By then, hip dysplasia should have shown its ugly head. We don't cause it, but we certainly don't help it. So 
Equipment wise, you can see Sansi is wearing a dog sled harness. This is very similar to what's used on dog teams. Hers is an H back because she's a very slim dog. The uh, proper fit for a harness is super important. You wouldn't want to run the marathon in your cousin's shoes, so your dog should not have your friend's dog's harness. It should be a custom fit. You should be able to put your hand in on one side, but not be able to turn it, except with two fingers thickness. If you can turn with your whole hand, it's too loose, and it should pull under stress from the base of the tail, right here. Now, there are short harnesses, that pull from here, but they're mostly designed for dog sled teams, and we really don't recommend those. And uh, I'm wearing a Skidor belt with about an eight foot line, which connects the harness. Sansi, line out. Line out, girl. <laughs> There's a little bungee section in here, in case your dog is the sort that likes to hit the end of the gang line at 400 kilometers per hour. And I wear a belt low on my hip, and uh, I ski and she pulls. What the? Oh, and one other thing is, if you're thinking of taking this up, you don't. We mostly skate ski with our dogs, but you don't have to buy expensive skate ski equipment right away. But what you do need is poles that basically come up to your ears. Your regular cross-country ski poles that come up to the center of the shoulder, they're no good because you're too bent over. So you need your, your longer poles. Other than that, your regular skis will work, but clean the kick wax off. You want no wax on it except glide. Otherwise, you're going to explore the old idea that every snowflake's different because you're going to be looking at the snow real close on the trail. Wham! Got to make sure every bit of that kick wax is gone. Okay, over to me. All right. Okay, so Pippin here is the Australian Shepherd. He's wearing an X-back harness, which looks like Sanzi's harness, but it's in the shape of an X. Again, it's fitted so that it comes to the base of where a tail would be if this breed had a tail, which they don't. <laughs> He's like a no tail on the trail. All right. So what Pippin is pulling today is an Esla kick sled. This is, uh, they come in three sizes, a T6, a T7, and a T8. Essentially, this was made in Finland and it was intended for use by humans only. It's brought over to Canada and it's modified for use as a kind of an urban dog sled. Um, the kick sled weighs about 18 pounds. It can carry 250 pounds on the seat uh, if you <laughs> can push that much. Um, and you stand on the kick plates and to turn it it's kind of like a mountain bike. So it's very flexible and also the Oops, I shouldn't run over Pip there, but... Okay, Pip, you gotta move. You gotta go around. Woohoo! Yeah, anyways, the, 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 the side on the runners can actually go out so that when you... It, it really aids when you want to make a sharp turn. You're gonna turn the handlebars and turn the sled by using the... by pushing out on the runners. Essentially, to move a kick sled, you lift your foot up and you put it down and you push backwards like that. It's kind of like longboarding when you're on a skateboard, right? So it's a really a long push to slow down. There's no brake on this. So I'm gonna put my heels on the ground and pull back. Right, that's gonna slow me down. And then to stop, I'm just gonna get off and hope that my dog will pay attention to me. <laughs> and that's kick sledding. All right, well, that was some great information about the dogs and the equipment. Can we see some demonstrations of what it looks like in motion? Sure. Absolutely. All right. That's what you gotta do when you're kick sledding sometimes. Get off and run. <laughs> Thank you.
All right, so that looked like a lot of fun with the dogs running down the trails with you. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about some of the trail etiquette and how you keep everyone safe when they're doing these sports? Okay, well, our first rule of thumb is that uh, when you are coming up on somebody and you'd like to pass them, you're going to call for trail. Might say something like, trail on your left. And the next thing you're going to watch for is for that person to give you an acknowledgement that they can hear you. Sometimes when you're wearing a toque or a headband, you can't actually hear someone yelling at you. Okay, and uh, then what do we do? Well, uh, lead tr the, the lead team, especially if you have a new team, is the one that controls the pass. So if you don't think that your dog can allow another dog to pass it on the fly, you need to pull over, take your dog to in, and then wave the next, the next uh, team through. Uh, this, as dogs become more professional, people don't always pull over and stop. But you are responsible for the pass if you're in the lead. And if you don't think your dog will do it well, then pull over, stop, take in the line. It's a courtesy. Hey, go, come on. All right, so we're back live and we're going to invite Susie and Lauren to join us again. So hopefully you enjoyed watching that footage uh, of some ski shoring and kick sledding and have a better idea of what those sports look like and the type of equipment used. Uh, so again, if you have any questions at all, please put them into uh, either the chat or the Q&A and we'd be happy to answer those for you. Uh, so we have a question here from Stephanie. Uh, how long did it take you to train your dogs and are there any specific actions you train them to do? Well, um, how long it takes to train your dog to some extent depends on the dog. Some are fast learners, some aren't. We do have a procedure though to start with uh, that we do and I'm gonna pass this to Susie because she's the queen of the procedure. <laughs> Thanks, Lauren. Okay, so generally when we start training our dogs, we're doing that what we call dry land training. So we start by putting them in harness. We teach them to go out in front of us. So that's, we're using a line out command. We teach them to go forward. I, I say hike, Lauren likes walk on as the go command. Then we use G to turn and ha to turn left and easy to slow down. Okay, so we do an awful lot of walking and uh, we hope that the dogs are working in tandem with their human so that when we get on snow, we've got some control over what they're doing. And I would say it takes about a winter for your dog to figure out what they're really doing, what you're really asking them to do. It helps sometimes if you also have an older dog, they learn very quickly from each other. And sometimes if we have someone who's kind of recalcitrant, uh, we'll hook them up with an experienced dog who will show them the ropes. All right, that's great. Um, so you may have already kind of answered this, uh, but Carol would like to know, how do you train your dog to get out in front of you? Ah, for that, we use wieners. We. Uh... We, we bait the dogs forward. Um, you can either throw the wiener ahead of you when you give out the, the line out command, or you have a partner who is about six feet in front of you and you tell your dog to line out and the dog goes to the partner that's standing six feet in front of you and they feed the dog a wiener. And then if you have that partner, then you get them to hold the dog in that position and tell them, you just tell them wait there. And the idea is the more you do this, the stronger you're going to have that line out command for when you really need it. <laughs> All right. Um, so we have another question here about equipment. Uh, can you rent this equipment? At this point, well, no. Huh? no. <laughs> Maybe Lauren can take that. You going to take uh, this one, Lauren? 
Oh, I can do so. Yeah, at this point, the uh, local providers do not rent equipment. Uh, we do in the club have a couple of older sleds that we rent to mem new members on a week by week basis until they can buy their own. But yeah, it's, um, I guess you could rent ski equipment somewhere, but you wouldn't be able to rent the kick sled or the gang lines or the belts. I would imagine that for uh, the skate ski equipment, uh, you might be able to rent that at uh, local shops that uh, rent cross country skis, classic skis. Um, they may also have skate ski equipment. Uh, so we have another question here from Madison. If you run two dogs, do they have to be the same size or can one be smaller? Well, there's no real reason that they have to be the same yes. size. Oh. I'm not sure how this is working. Go ahead. Okay, there's no real reason why we uh, they need to be the same size. The dogs would be attached by a splitter, which I have here, just a Y shape. So uh, unlike, there's no single trees like with horses. So you just hook them up and they run side by side. Sometimes the little ones are big motivators for the big ones. It's, uh, we do have some interesting combinations sometimes. Susie, did you have anything you wanted to add on that? No, I think I'm good. Yeah. We've had plenty of combinations as Lauren's put. The, the main thing is that the dogs move at the same pace. Uh, however, we do have a, a one of our club members, oh, and, and for somebody who asked what club we're with, um, we're with Snow Motion. Uh, it's a winter dog sports club. But we do have one club member who runs a little white terrier alongside the sled <laughs> on a leash, right? But it can somehow, when it can't keep up, they just pick up the dog and pop it onto the, the sled seat in a, in a bag and off they go. All right. A uh, question here about uh, paw protection from the ice. Uh, do you use anything like that to keep the dog's paws protected? I can answer that one, Lauren. Um, okay, so what it. I'm holding here, what I'm holding here is a booty. This is made out of polar fleece. Um, it comes with a Velcro bit and you pop it over their paw and you crank the strap around so that it's held on tightly to the dog's paw. That's for uh, generally for days when you don't want them to cut their paws on ice. For warmer days, we use a product called Musher's Secret and you just take it and it's, a, it's a edible paw wax and you put it inside the base of their paw and that keeps the ice balls from forming in there. Right. The, uh, if I could add into this, um, there's a, a big a real thing right now with putting boots on your dogs, which I really, really disagree with. Uh, there's two reasons to put boots on your dogs, to protect them from ice or protect them from developing snowballs between the pads. Um, a lot of dogs will never form those snowballs. And uh, there's no reason to put boots on your dog because it's cold. Dogs have a whole system to deal with cold feet. They can direct the blood either to the center of the paw or the outside. So we're in the house, they direct to the outside so they can cool. When they go outside, they direct it to the center and the pad will almost be zero degrees and a dog who's out all the time. And um, so yeah, boots for warmth, no, uh, traditional, uh, dog sled boots are just leather pads with the toes exposed for grip designed just to protect the pads from sharp shards of ice. But uh, most of us don't run our dogs in boots. It's only if you have a big snowball problem. Susie's dogs have snowballs. <laughs> That's true. All right. Uh, Caroline would like to know, how do you keep your dog going straight down the trail, uh, not making a sharp left turn? Okay, I think I'd say that that uh, well really go for our dry land training in the beginning where we are doing an awful lot of walking in the fall, uh, teaching them to, I think in most cases you have to teach your dog to go on by, 
they want to stop and they want to sniff things. They want to stop and stare at birds in the trees. They want to pee on things if they're boys. <laughs> and uh, so mostly we're, we're working on on by. And so on by gradually becomes the command where it means not only go past something, but also if you come to a, a, a turn in the trail, on by also means to go forward. Lauren, what do you think? Well, the only thing I point out is what we didn't talk about in the video is we have a whole language we use with our dogs. When we start in the trail, we call line out. Dogs should go to the end of the line, hold it firm. We then understand what direction we're going and we know the line's not tangled. Walk on is what I used to go, though neither of my dogs are prone to walking. As we're cruising down the trail, if we wanna go faster, we say hike or hike, hike. If we want to go slower, we go easy. If we want to go buy something, a dog, a deer, a delightful dead deer buffet, whatever interests them, it's on by. And uh, G is right. Ha is left. As you get more sophisticated, G over means to pass to the right of something. Ha over means to pass to the left. They, over time, develop a, a form of harness discipline. My old boy, Beowulf, has run by deer by the side of the trail who were no more than about five meters away on six occasions. I simply said, on by, he kept hammering down the trail. He complained about it for a kilometer and a half, but we kept going. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's practice. The dogs learn their job, they get harness discipline. We don't allow our dogs to socialize each, with each other when they're in harness because they just know that's their job. In harness, they're not playing. Some of them, if they have special friends, will do a little secret nose touch as they go by, but they know that they don't get to hang out together until after the run. Once the harness is off, then they get to be free dogs again. Anything you want to add, Susie? No, I'm good. All right, we've had quite a few questions come in about equipment. Uh, where do you purchase this equipment and what is the uh, rough cost of it? Well, I can talk about skijoring first. Uh, you can, whatever cross country ski gear you have right now, will do to start with. Uh, we use skate gear because we use skate skiing. Skate skiing is just what you use if you're a downhill skier to go from one part of the top of the hill to the other. It's what we use in classic skiing to cross frozen lakes and when it's a little icy. Uh, the only thing with regular classic gear is you don't have that nice ankle support. So it's hard for you to do it for five or 10 straight kilometers. But Cross country ski out or skate ski outfit can run you five, six hundred bucks or more, depending where you buy it from and the quality. So, we don't really recommend that you charge off and do that. We recommend that you get poles who come up to your ears. That's uh, that allows you to ski in a more upright position. Uh, we make sure you strip every last bit of that kick wax off because there's nothing more fun than flying down a hill and having your ski catch a bit of a stick in that kick wax and stop dead. Well, your one ski stops dead. The rest of you obeys uh, Newton's laws of motion and keeps going for a little bit. So um, in terms of the skijor gear, you need a belt. You need a gang line. You can get those at Canvasback in Lockport. You can get them at Prairie Dog. The harness you can also get at Canvasback. Um, and you can also at Prairie Dog. At Prairie Dog, Rob Custom makes them, which is nice if you have an odd shaped dog because a lot of harnesses are designed with husky bodies in mind and we get a lot of different shaped dogs. So if you don't get a good fit at Canvasback, you can go over to Rob and uh, he'll, measure up your dog and make you a very nice harness. So a belt and gang line, uh, depending on the grade you do, like mine, mine is very traditional, very simple. It just has a belt, which look, goes around the shaped piece of line to a carbine binger to, uh, so you can take it off and a long gang line. So you can get that for as little as 80 bucks. Um, Harnesses, your basic harness can be 25, 30 bucks, 40, although you can pay a lot more than that. You don't really need to. So for skijoring, once you got your your uh, your skis, really you're only looking at about 120 bucks 
And I've been using that belt and gang line now for 14 years. They last. Well, I've changed the gang line. They, and that's not expensive. So it's not really an expensive sport. I'll let Susie talk about kick sleds. Okay. Well, uh, we have on the Snowmotion website, www.snowmotion.ca, we have a links page. And on the top left side of our links page, we have uh, equipment suppliers. So you can go on to, you can look at their websites. Uh, kick sledding became the new must have sport of the winter. <laughs> so Kick sleds, the Esla kick sleds have all sold out. I checked uh, today and uh, they're, they're, there's a waiting list at Canvas back for them. So if people are interested, they can put their name on the waiting list. I don't know whether they're gonna be getting more shipments in this winter or not, or whether generally they wait and put an order in in the fall. Uh, Esla, the company that makes them is actually sold out in Finland this year it's so popular as people try to find sports that they can do outdoors uh, and uh, put their pup to good use. But as Lauren said the club does have a couple of old kick sleds that we rent to our newer members. Uh, those are unfortunately also rented out pretty much to mid-March at this point so we've uh, had a lot of kick uh, kick sleds range in price from, let's see, I think you can get a T7. The T6s are cheaper, they're shorter. The T7s are the middle size, they range about 450 with it with tax. Uh, the T8s are the tallest version, those are good for people who are six feet or taller, and those would be more expensive. I just noticed someone asking how much, and I'd just like to point out that the kick sled itself is not designed for dogs. You need to have a uh, bridle put on it, which Canvasback does. Price, like Susie said, is about 450, but there's not a lot of risk because the resale's ridiculous. If people move away or if they really don't want to do it, we let them sell them on our website. And I think our record was like 90 seconds before it was sold. In the summer, it takes longer, but you can sell them pretty much, pretty close to what you paid for them. So it's, uh, it's not, it's, it's hard with the sticker price, eh? but uh, you're not really risking much. And well, the fun thing I would like the kids to take them down the bay. I, I'm going to point out that we forgot to mention uh, Prairie Dog also makes a locally made kick sled. It, <clears throat> it's a little bit more like a dog sled. Um, oh, Lauren. Excuse me one moment, please. I have to go <laughs> tell someone to be quiet. Okay, <laughs> so Prairie Dog, yeah, Prairie Dog does build a sled. It's kind of a work in progress. I know he's been uh, building them and and upgrading. And he, I understand he's been known to call people up and say, hey, the part you got in there, I don't like it anymore. Bring it back and I'll change it. Uh, and he also is at Lockport and you can contact him. One thing I like to remind people of though with uh, Rob, because he's a fireman, you call right before you go because sometimes he has an appointment and a truck gets on fire on the 59 and he's gone when you get there. So always call right before you go just to confirm because he always doesn't always have time to call you. But he builds, he makes very nice harness and he uh, makes good equipment. Are you back then? I'm back. Sorry about that. Somebody was playing really loudly. All right. So uh, there's a really good question here about the bungee line that you use. Uh, can you use the same type of bungee line for both kick sledding and ski shoring, or do you need different types of bungees? Well, the, the line itself is not bungee. There's just a little shock absorber uh, in some place on it. It can be the same line, though length has changed depending on your situation. Uh, because my dog is pulling from just above. Oh, Lauren froze. Lindsay? Long the line stop. for that kid. Oh, there he is. You froze oh, there. there a little bit, Lauren. Oh, I, I froze? Can, yeah, maybe you can go back and repeat that. 
Uh, I, was, I was just saying that uh, because kick sledding and, uh, and Kijoring is a little different in the Sansi has a line coming from just above her tail, which is pretty level coming to my waist. Now, if she were pulling a kick sled, that line would go down to the push bar on the, on the kick sled, which if the line's too short, will pull her hips down. One, so you often have a longer line or you can actually get a harness designed for the kick sled. And I'll let Susie explain what the difference is there. Okay, yeah. Uh, the line does come down to about two inches off the ground right by the brush bow, on, which is that front part on the kick sled that stops you from smacking into things. Okay, um, the kick sled harness, uh, in the, in, when we first started the sport, we were using what used to be called a weight pole harness. It, the traces came down the side of the dog and then there was a bar that was resting between the two sides of the harness that, just above their hawks. Uh, we've since then we've we've the harnesses don't have that bar, but the, you can buy what's called a wheel dog harness, either from Prairie Dog. There is a, a new harness supplier up in Toulon, but I can't remember the name of the. It's a store, um, but they are selling a product by a harness maker called Howling Dog Alaska. You can look that up online, and if you're interested in a specific harness for kick sledding, uh, you would get something called the Wheel Dog Harness. Uh, wheel Dog, for those of you who want to go further and take up dog sledding, uh, in dog sledding you have your leaders. Then you, let's say you've got six dogs on the line. You've got two closest to the sled are called the Wheel Dogs because they're in the wheel position. They're pulling the sled from side to side. Then you have team dogs, and then you way at the front of the line, you're gonna have a couple of leaders. Okay, Lindsay? Yeah. Although that, that does lead us to something else, which is what can you do in the summer or in the spring and fall? And many of us use the same long gang line to hook to the steering column of our bike, or some people have scooters and we run our dogs. Now you have to be super careful because you can overheat a dog, especially in the pavement, but uh, we often light up lights and we'll go at night. And my, we have a, my dogs and I have a route that actually leads to the river. So we'll do about 5K to the river, then they swim, then 5K down the river, and then they swim again, and then 5K home. But we do continue on in the summer using the same harnesses, the same gang lines, just attached to other things. Oh, and the Skajor belt is fantastic if you like to run with your dog. Uh, the only recommendation I make is get rid of the eight foot gang line, put a six foot leash on because you don't want your dog arriving at blind corners too much before you. It can, get, it can get a little hazardous. And when we run at night, when it's hot, we're all lit up with flashing collars and things to uh, make sure that drivers see it. All right, so uh, you were talking a little bit about uh, dogs wanting to be in the lead. Uh, and Jackie has a question. She says uh, her dog is part husky and part shepherd, and she always has to be in the lead. Uh, would she be, be better at kick sledding or at ski juring? Oh, either. Well, that's what you want. You want a dog. You know what? The only thing we can't cure in a dog is an unwillingness to pull. If you got a dog that wants to be in the lead, you got aces. Love it. What could possibly go wrong? You know, a long go, <laughs> fine now. What could possibly go wrong? But yeah, no, it doesn't matter. You want your dog to lead out. You want your dog to pull. You're going to teach the dog easy. If you're coming to a hill, for instance, you're going to call easy. And then as you experience, you can get the dog to come and run on your left side. You gather up the Oh, looks like Lauren froze again. It's not that cold outside. He shouldn't be freezing. I oh, know. Maybe I'll just take that question up. Uh, okay, sure. so uh, what I do is I actually do both sports. I was demonstrating kick sledding for the videos because we needed a kick sledder. But I start with kick sledding in the fall when there's just a little bit of snow and I can go around my block in the city using my kick sleds. When the trails are groomed, I prefer to switch over to skijoring because it drops that 18 pounds of dead weight that the sled has, and it allows Pippin and I to go faster. Then if we're on so-so trails, 
uh, I can switch to, I can, I can, let's say we, we go to a trail that isn't necessarily groomed nicely, uh, maybe on a river, I might switch back to kick sledding just to give myself more stability. That's the main part about kick sledding is it's, it's, it, it, it can be a little more work for the human, but it adds that element of stability. And the thing about it is that if your dog is heading for the bushes, <laughs> you can always bail out. I know Lauren's gonna tell me that the number one rule is never let go of the sled, but sometimes you just have to. Um, yeah, so uh, I'd say to Jackie that you teach your dog to pull and then you decide what you want to do. Um, we're going to be coming back in the, I know somebody had a question about lessons. We can't hold any lessons right now because of the pandemic, but we are hoping to have our dry land training start up in the fall, depending on, on what the province has in terms of, um, you know, how many people we can have together in a group outside. So yeah, just keep an eye on the snow motion website and our social media, and uh, we'll let you know whether we can hold those lessons. Yeah. yeah, we look forward to being able to have groups get together again. I know. Uh, so while we're on the topic of dogs and different breeds, uh, Melanie has a question. Uh, she says she's planning to adopt. Are there breeds or temperaments to look for other than a husky? Other than a husky. Is, is, is Lauren back in, in the video uh, call? No, or? no, we've lost Lauren temporarily. Hopefully he joins well, us again. <laughs> Okay, well, I've, I've run quite a few different types of dogs on the gang line. I've had uh, I've had racing teams of Alaskan Huskies. An Alaskan Husky really is a a Siberian Husky crossed with something like a, a Greyhound way back when, or possibly even a Border Collie. Today, pretty much in snow motion, you're going to see everything. If you need a fast dog. Uh, that's going to pull you at a great rate of, let's say you want to go fast, I would pick a breed like a German short-haired pointer. Uh, the Australian Shepherds are surprisingly fast and so are uh, lab, lab, Labradors. They're amazingly, pull, amazingly good pulling dogs. Uh, Siberians are also quite fast still. If you've got, if you want to go a little slower or let's say you just need more pull, a lot of people go for the larger breeds. A Malamute is a nice, steady pulling dog. They're not a racing dog, but you can still get a nice pull out of them. Other than that, anything you want is a family pet, right? You want a dog with a good temperament, a dog that's gonna work with you, uh, a dog that maybe you can do other sports with. I do fly ball, I do uh, rally obedience with mine. I do, well, uh, frisbee. I have a border collie. One thing I'd like to point out is that I spent my, ooh, uh, this is my first Australian Shepherd and I spent all my previous years in the club with border collies on the gang line and they don't pull the same way. <laughs> they're front wheel drive. So they pull from their front feet with their head and their body low versus the Aussie is a very upright dog and boy can he pull like crazy. <laughs> I don't think I've gone so fast in my whole life. <laughs> All right, uh, and one more question about dog breeds. Um, so uh, this is an anonymous attendee, um, but hopefully they're still on the line here with us. Uh, they have a very nervous dog and it might be because they came up too close behind her going down a hill and now the dog doesn't trust her anymore. Um, so any tips or advice on how to retrain your dog or how to gain trust with your dog if you're in that type of situation? Right. Okay. In that, in that sort of case, if you've got a nervous dog, especially on hills, I would go back to dry land training on the flat, right? Encourage the dog. Oh, I did forget about Samoids. <laughs> I'm sorry, Samoid people. I love Sammies. <laughs> I just read a question coming in there. Anyway, so with nervous dogs, we deal with a lot of reactive dogs and this is where that what I mentioned about cross training comes back in. The more obedience work you do with your dog, the more you can foster that partnership between you and what you're asking your dog to do. If it's rally obedience, if it's just plain old tricks, uh, our reactive dogs come into the club. And the first thing we teach everyone is to 
A, carry food. So the dog has something to pay attention to. It's a big lure having a bag full of, you know, like cut up wieners in your pocket. But the second thing we ask them to do is teach their dog a trick. So if dog is busy barking or dog is looking nervous, we get their attention back on the handler. We say, okay, dog, sit, dog, shake a paw. And then we give them that piece of wiener. So I would, in retraining a dog to, to ignore um, you coming up behind them is one, work on the flat, two, do other things with your dog, and three, always use food as a reward, uh, whether it's cheese or wieners or biscuits or whatever they can handle. Yeah, and just keep working with that. And hills are a very tricky thing to negotiate. We go to uh, another park, uh, Spruce Woods, which has a trail designated for our sports. It's the, uh, is it the Yellow Quill, the Algonquin Trail System. Yep. Uh, and uh, there are hills there where we just have to let the dogs go because <laughs> I'm going down the hill on my rear end and you know I can't I can't ski down some of these things so I sit on my skis and I just let the dog go ahead of me. Uh, quite often I've noticed in the past couple of years that I'm quite often the only skajor going on that particular road trip. The rest of them are all on kick sleds so they've got that ability to uh, slow themselves down and the sled and they can also walk down the hill versus me who <laughs> I may end up walking down you know, taking off the skis and walking down yeah because you don't want to hit your dog it it doesn't make a good impression <laughs> no no I could see that becoming problematic <laughs> yeah all right uh Randy would like to know uh do you need to wax the kick sled skis uh Generally, no, because the they were they they the runners on them are made out of a sort of a plastic that seems to to slide very nicely over the snow. No matter you know between zero and say minus twenty, when you get below minus twenty, you're not getting that same sort of glide. However, that said, some of us use uh, we go over to Lee Valley Tools in Winnipeg and we buy something called Glide Coat. And this is originally intended to lubricate things like, uh, what do you call them, table saws. And you just give it a squirt down each runner and you're good to go. All right. Uh, and there was a question about making your own kick sled. Are there any patterns out there for people feeling a little crafty and wanting to tackle that project? I've seen people make kick sleds out of those honking big wide shovels that have the big scoop in the front and the big long handlebar in the back. Uh, I saw somebody mount that onto a pair of skis. I've also seen people mount kitchen chairs <laughs> onto a pair of skis. In fact, there's somebody in Winnipeg on Facebook whose, whose husband made her a, a homemade kick sled. Yeah. So you, you can get crafty. We had, uh, for years, we had a guy in the club who made one in his wood shop. Uh, it didn't fold down. Like the, the nice part about Fieslas is that they fold down almost completely flat, only the seat is sticking up a little bit. So uh, you can fold it down and put it inside your car. We've seen them get squished into hatchbacks <laughs> quite often. Yeah, uh, that's the main difference between that and a dog sled. If you have a dog sled, you got to carry it on the roof and don't go through the Tim Hortons drive-through ever. You might get a little stuck. Or you get, <laughs> or you get matchsticks. <laughs> All right, uh, Rich is doing something called canny crossing. Uh, so first of all, Susie, you'll have to enlighten me on what that is because I've never heard that term, but he's doing it with three border collies and he has a kick sled uh, that's hopefully going to arrive this winter. Uh, he wants to know, what do you suggest is the best layout for running a kick sled with three dogs? With three dogs, okay. Uh, and generally- any crossing, if you can explain okay. that one as well. Canny cross is, is cross country running with the dog attached to your belt. So it, in the beginning, it used to be called jog joring which sort of was a combination of skijoring and jogging, but now it's, it's all canny cross. Uh, so it sounds like his dogs are already, have already learned to pull. 
So there are quite a few options that you can you can attach them to your kick sled. So the kick sled needs, for starters, it needs that bridle that is attached to the sled and it comes to a point right out in front of the sled. So that's what's the part that's on the sled. Then you have the gang line out front and there's usually a bungee built into the gang line somewhere there or you can get pieces. And then on the front of that, um, I use what's called a splitter and it's a fairly short piece of rope and it's got three lines. So each line goes to the, the rear end of, of the dogs on the team. Okay, I like running them in a troika pattern. Other people will just attach three gang lines to the front of the sled and have that sort of arctic fan hitch, seen that. I've also seen it where you have a single dog in the front and then you have two dogs hitched uh, further back along the gang line in a traditional sledding uh, form. So pretty much anything you want. <laughs> you know, I've seen people just put the gang line on the front and then put three leashes off the front of that and go with that. Uh, the main thing is that you never ever, I saw somebody doing this the other day with a, they got a kick sled and they had a lab and they had the, they had the person hanging onto the lab's leash which went, led to the dog's collar and you don't want a dog pulling you that way because you could damage their, their neck. Yeah. All right. Uh, do you have to worry about running dogs in the colder weather like what we've had lately? Uh, well, I've been just too chicken to go out <laughs> running in this kind of weather. Uh, at my, the club shuts down our, our, our club runs at minus 26. And that's a combination of temperature and wind chill. So we haven't been doing anything for the past three weeks. Uh, we could, I suppose, but um, you have to know what you're doing in terms of what you are wearing personally. Uh, I wear goggles, ski goggles, because my eyes tear up and I wear many, many layers. Um, but it's just not very pleasant running. And your skis don't have any glide. At below minus 20. It's like skiing on cardboard at that point. There's no glide. You're just kind of walking along and it's just too much of a slog. So we're not quite fair weather <laughs> athletes, but you know, we do like that minus 10 to minus 50 Celsius. Yeah, and Riley has a question that kind of goes in line with this. Uh, he says, dogs often work themselves to exhaustion. Uh, running with a dog is kind of unnatural for them on a leash as they're competing to keep up. So how do you know if you're working your dog too hard, uh, if that's even a thing? Uh, okay. I guess it might depend on the type of dog you have, um, but right. is it possible to work your dog too hard or, or to know if you're uh, doing too much with them in the cold weather? Yes, it is possible. There's been many a beginner who said, okay, I'm going to go out on this trail. It's a five kilometer loop or worse, they get onto the river and they go too far. And then they end up having to almost carry their dog back to the, <laughs> the start line because they've gone so far that the dog has quit. Uh, Huskies have this interesting tail carriage where when they've got energy, the tail is up and as they start losing energy that tail goes down my one of our co-coordinators calls it the gas tank needle so he says yeah you can always tell when they're tired in the beginning when we when we do our training walks we suggest people do 15 minutes of activity right and then gradually you might want to double that the next time up to 30 minutes and you want to see how comfortable your dog is working with you for that extended period of time when we're out in a club situation, I'm taking beginners, we go 50 feet and we stop. And uh, then we go another 50 feet and we stop and beginners only do a three kilometer loop in the beginning because they, the dogs may not have built up the stamina. They need, um, they're gonna build up muscle, they're gonna build up their heart, their lungs by doing the sports. So you're gonna end up with a stronger dog at the end of the season. And this is something that they regularly see when they're running long distance sled dogs is that the, the more they train, it's like they're, they are athletes. So the more they train, the more capacity they're going to have for doing the sports. Uh, in the beginning, um, like I, I'm running a 12 year old dog as well. Pippin's less than two, but uh, Dinah is 12 and she still likes to get out and we do like a little 
you know, a little five minute taste tester sort of thing for her. So she's, uh, she has her little bit of fun and then she goes back in the house. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's nice to know that you can have dogs of different ages participating together. All right, uh, Randy wants to know if you can quickly go over the commands again. Uh, it cut out a little bit for him last time. So what okay, so the use? okay, yeah, the commands that we use are we use uh, line out, and line out means to go. Oh, my dogs are listening to me. It's kind of funny. <laughs> line out means to take the line directly out in front of me and to stay at the end of the line. Think of it, it was when you start going on your walk. Your dog's going to take a look at your body language and going to go, okay, well, Susie's going to walk this way on the sidewalk, so I'm going to go directly in front of her, right? That's line out. Uh, we use hike to go forward. Uh, Lauren likes to use walk on. Uh, he comes from a more of a horse driving tradition. I came from a, a dog driving position. Um, then we use, sorry, <laughs> Pippin is bugging me now. He says, mom, you're talking my language. Uh, we use G to turn right and ha to turn left. And this command is given about five feet out from a corner and the dogs are looking, they start looking for that corner as you're, you're approaching them. If your dog's going faster, you're gonna to have to give that command maybe 15 feet out from the corner. Uh, okay, then we're going to use easy, easy. We're gonna drop our voices to get them to slow down. And then once they've stopped, I'm gonna tell them to wait. At no point do we ever use the word whoa because it sounds like no. And we never refer to what we're doing. We never say mush, for example. <laughs> Mushing is the sport, it's not the command. Yeah. Oh, and I forgot on by. I think I use on by the most <laughs> for my dogs. <laughs> they have to go on by the tree, they have to go on by. And the really funny part is Lauren likes to use hike, hike to go faster. I actually say squirrel. <laughs> Nope. Yeah, we can hear you saying squirrel in the video and yeah, that definitely uh, had your pup running. <laughs> All right, uh, Madison would like to know how many times per week is it safe to take your dog out uh, when you're just starting out? Okay, well, you can go out daily. Again, it's, it's a matter of, of how long you want to have that session. When you're beginning, you don't want to do any more than 15 minutes. Right, because it's a it's something it's asking the dogs to think about something new. It's a little bit complicated on your end, especially if you're a beginner skijor, because you have to watch your dog, and you have to figure out what you're doing with your skis at the same time. Uh, generally, when we've got somebody starting skijoring, we get them to sort of crouch into sort of an invisible chair, so they got their knees flexed and they're using those poles, and they're just going to double pole and push themselves along. That way, you can keep your head up. And you can watch the ears of the dog ahead of you. Are they are they facing back towards you and listening, or are they <laughs> have they found the squirrel before you have, <laughs> sort of thing? So 15 minutes to start with. Um, the club beginners tend to do about we tend to do about half an hour. But as I said, we go 50 feet, we stop, we make sure everybody's good. Go another 50 feet, we stop, and we're only doing three kilometers to start with. Older dogs. If you're starting, I started with an older dog. Uh, we definitely kept those training sessions pretty short. Yeah, I'm like the pup who can drag me around for <laughs> an hour or two or three. <laughs> All right, uh, and one more question here about, uh, do you need to do these sports on a trail or can you do them on a river or a field? Yes, okay, so they're generally what we're doing when we go to a park like like Birds Hill, like Spruce Woods or the White Shell, all of which have designated trails, we are on the flat groom trail, right? It, it, it's good for skate skiing because for skate skiing, which is the movement we're doing when we are skijoring mostly, or we're just double polling. Uh, it also accommodates people running along behind the kick sled. That said, um, I'm kick sledding currently these days on the uh, sort of the goat path along the Assiniboine River. I'm not going on the walking path, you know, the official one that the Forks puts in every year, but there's these really wide paths along the, closer to the riverbank. So I'm, I'm kick sledding along there. Uh, we also go to the La Barrier Park and go on the river there. So pretty much any river that you know 
has been traveled on by snowmobiles and that you can see people are, are we, we actually have a club member who goes out and drills holes to test ice thickness. So we're using those. Uh, there are people in the, in the country who lay down their own paths. Uh, they might have a snowmobile handy and they can just drag their own trail. But kick sledding again is more accommodating because I can pick up my kick sled and I can cross a road by walking versus the skis. I have to take off the skis, <laughs> you know, or just, just walk to the river wearing my ski boots and, and yeah. not that I fall over much. Yeah, and uh, this, you know, it's just harder walking ski boots than it is in regular boots. And this question has come up uh, quite frequently in our Q and A and our chat boxes tonight. Um, so, what other locations in Manitoba parks can ski jeering and kick sledding be done on? Um, so, Susie, I'll let you uh, maybe talk about some of the other locations. But just so people know, uh, any of our trails that are designated for cross country skiing only are for cross-country skiing only, not skiing with your dog. Um, so we do have other trails in Birds Hill. We have the Group Youth One Road. We also have Spruce Trail, uh, which used to be part of the old Tamarack snowmobile trail system. Uh, it's been separated now. So those are ones that you can use in Birds Hill for ski jeering and kick sledding. Uh, in other provincial parks, any trails that are marked as a multi-use trail um, so we do have multi-use trails in Grand Beach and Turtle Mountain, uh, Spruce Woods, and quite a few other provincial parks. Uh, any that are marked as a multi-use can be used for skate skiing, ski juring, uh, sometimes also walking, fat biking, um, any of those winter activities. Uh, so Susie, maybe there's some other trails that you'd like to point out in Manitoba parks that people may want to check out. Right. Well, in Manitoba, we've also gone up to Riding Mountain. It's, it is a federal park, but they also have multi-use trails. I'd like to point out that our friend Dave uh, Lumgare down in Morden uh, runs a ski area called Shannondale. He's uh, very dog friendly. You do have to look up the Shannondale website and contact Dave before you arrive with the dog, though, because he likes to know what, what you know who's coming out. In, um, let's see, Falcon, Falcon Ridge. Mm -hmm. Falcon Ridge uh, Ski Resort is also ski, ski jor and kick sled friendly. Uh, they are asking that uh, people who do those, do our sports, don't go on the weekends though, because they're packed with their, their physically distanced ski, ski downhill and, and cross country skiers. So they're asking that people come during the week. We also travel as far out as uh, Kenora regularly, well, we normally travel to Kenora. And uh, there's plenty of trails out in the Kenora area. They're, they're extremely lucky. People drive snowmobiles all over the place and any flat pack trail is good to use. Yeah, but we, uh, you know, we've, we've done, um, where else have we gone? Uh, there's a, there, there are a couple of other clubs in Manitoba. There's uh, Pat Shannon uh, who runs uh, Crazy Jumpers up in the Interlake. She has a skijoring club. And then there's Rochelle. Oh dear. Uh, she's at the Farm Pet Retreat in St. Um, St. Claude, I think. Yep. Shout out to Rochelle. She also runs a club. So they, each of those have a small trail system. Great. And Susie, what's the website again for Snow Motion if people have uh, questions or they're wanting more information on ski jeering and kick sledding? Okay, it's snowmotion.ca. So snowmotion is all one word there and you're gonna find information about the club itself, about the equipment, uh, there are links to trails. There are tons of pictures, lots of videos showing the club over the years. And uh, at the there's also a contact us page so people can send us an email to our Gmail account. Awesome. Well, Susie and uh, Lauren, unfortunately, we lost Lauren. I'm not sure. Maybe uh, maybe the dog pulled him away into the snowbank. Um, but uh, thank you both so, so much for joining us this evening and uh, for doing the pre-filming with us and sharing all your knowledge and expertise on these 
super cool winter dog sports. Uh, hopefully our audience has a chance to get out and try them. If not this winter, then uh, maybe work ahead for next winter and give these sports a try. They're a lot of fun. Uh, Susie let me do a quick little run on her kick sled when we were filming. And uh, yeah, it is a great sport. If I had a dog, I would definitely out, be out there trying this out. Um, so again, if you do have any questions, you can get a hold of Susie or Lauren through the snowmotion.ca website. If you're looking for information on parks, uh, Manitoba Provincial Parks and where you can do these sports, you can visit us at manitobaparks.com or through Facebook or Twitter at mbgovparks. There's lots of great information there on uh, these winter sports as well as many others. There's maps. Uh, and also weekly grooming reports for the trails so that you know uh, when the trails have been done. Uh, so we do hope that you visit us out in Manitoba Parks this winter. If you do, please keep in mind all public COVID health uh, guidelines. Uh, practice the fundamentals of physical distancing from anyone not in your household. And remember to always practice leave no trace. Help us keep our parks clean. Uh, so again, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. If you're interested in upcoming webinars, our next one is the Owls of Manitoba on Saturday, February 20th at 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, details and registration information is available on the Manitoba Parks Facebook page or online at manitobaparks.com. So thank you again everyone for joining us. Have a great evening and stay safe at home. Good night.